Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Mark Stein, whose writing on war, politics, the arts, and culture can be read around the world from the Atlantic Monthly to the Australian. He's the author of America Alone, The End of the World as We Know It. He is visiting uh, the Berkeley campus as the 2007 Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz Lecturer at Berkeley. Joining us in the studio is Professor Emeritus Thomas Barnes of History and Law. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Mark, welcome to Berkeley. Glad to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in uh, Toronto, and uh, I had, uh, I guess, the bulk of my uh, schooling over in uh, the United Kingdom uh, at uh, King Edward School, which I was yeah. just talking with Professor Barnes, is the uh, alma mater of J.R.R. Tolkien, among <laughs> others. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, however well my book does, it's never going to be the top bestseller to be produced by anyone from that school. Um, and uh, so I'm basically, I regard myself as a child of the uh, of the, the, the tail end of, uh, of uh, the British Empire, as it were. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, <clears throat> that's, that's interesting. My, my father's Irish and my mother's Belgian, and they both wound up in Canada in completely different ways. My father was doing what a lot of um, young men did at that time. He was just kind of loafing around the colonies for a couple of years. My mother was there in, in more... Uh, dramatic circumstances. Like her family had decided to abandon uh, her native country of Belgium and they just happened uh, to pick uh, Canada because their town had been liberated by Canadian troops at the end of the Second World War and that's why they chose Canada. A lot of people did that. A lot of Dutch people did as well. Uh, and so in a sense their, uh, their reasons for being in Canada were completely different. Uh, one uh, was there just uh, out of that kind of sense of entitlement that the English-speaking peoples have, that they can kind of go all over the world and live where they want and do as they please, and whereas my mother was uh, just sort of swept there by the tides of history. And uh, I do think, in a sense, uh, that, that, that kind of difference uh, uh, resonates with me to this day, really. Was there a lot of talk around the dinner table about politics, art, and culture? Because you, you cover so many topics in your writing, and your writing is so globalized, in a way. Well, I, I don't think um, my my mother is a completely apolitical person. You know, if if she if she has any kind of credo, it's uh, you know the Beatles. All you need is love, and I just roll <laughs> I roll my eyes and and uh, and move on to. <laughs> and this is a woman, you know, who basically grew up under Nazi occupation Precise. and must understand mm -hmm. at some basic level. Uh, that, th that this is not going to take you far in, in exceptional circumstances. Uh, my father, I think, was a great influence on me, at least in, in terms of uh, my cultural writing, because he certainly had a very uh, broad range of, uh, of musical uh, and, and uh, cultural interests in, in that way. Mm -hmm. and, and what, uh, did you have any teachers or mentors who, who pushed you in the de direction of wanting to be a writer? Yeah. Uh, I did. I did have uh, school teachers that did have an uh, impact on me. They were good teachers. Uh, I was. I was not a good uh, student, really. Right from I would say what would now be I don't know grade uh, six or seven, the equivalent. Um, that uh, I was. I, I got bored easily, and if I, I felt I'd kind of mastered the general thrust of things, I had a tendency. My mind had a tendency to wander off. Uh, I wasn't a particularly good student. I, I was uh, brilliantly adept at inventing uh, ever more implausible excuses as to why uh, certain homework hadn't been turned <laughs> in on time. And, uh, and I think, in, I think uh, 
what I did like about what I did like about the teachers I had was that uh, they put up with a lot of that, and they still uh, gave you credit for when you uh, when you did things things right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sometimes uh, pleasantly surprised when you happen to be going through the attic or whatever, and you find something you wrote at 14, and you thought, my goodness, this actually uh, this actually stands mm -hmm. up pretty well. Mm -hmm. It's it's the voice in embryo. Mm -hmm. I happen to read. Um, so, uh, an essay that Kingsley Amis, the British novelist, uh, wrote at school when he was 11. And it is like, uh, it is actually the first yeah. draft of a Kingsley Amis yeah. novel. If there was like a kind of junior Amis, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what it yeah. would be like. All, all the kind of muscle and vigor of the prose uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, is there present in embryo, and I, I think that's always uh, good when you can see You that. told a tale yesterday to Brandon Little's 101 section about having gone t to the attic and found a book that you found very, very useful when it came in precisely yeah. to doing the work for. You might recount that because I think that's revelatory of well, two things. <coughs> I think it's revelatory, first of all, of the nature of the education you got. I think it's also revelatory. It gives a lie to your, to your, to your assertion that you were just more or less a goof off. Well, I, I, I uh, after September 11th, right. I found myself not. Uh, everybody suddenly had to become an expert on Islam. Right. You know, we were all suddenly got out the maps of Afghanistan mm -hmm. and were pointing out what was going to go right and what was going to go wrong. Uh, and I didn't actually find a lot of the commentary in the uh, newspapers useful, not just the pundits, but every time they'd call on some professor of Middle Eastern studies to write something. And particularly when it came to Wahhabism, which is the, the form of uh, Islam that the Saudis have done such a grand job of exporting all over the world, and it rang a, a very dim and distant bell with me that I'd mm. come across it before. And I remembered what it was, which was that at high school, uh, at some point doing a particular obscure corner of Indian history, uh, we'd uh, learned about the attempted Wahhabi subversion of British India. They did very well at one point. Mm. Uh, uh, one, uh, one guy fatally stabbed the Chief Justice of India, mm -hmm. and uh, the following year uh, another Wahhabi fatally stabbed uh, the Viceroy. And uh, as I said to Professor Barnes, these, these were yesterday yeah. in the class, these were in fact the highest profile uh, mm. successes of the Wahhabist That's movement right. until Still September 11. And, I'd, uh, and I kind of had a vague memory of that. And uh, I went uh, upstairs uh, to the attic where I had my old school books. And I went through the relevant history mm. books and I found the one. Uh, and I looked up a little bit more on it, and it actually is in, that incident is in America alone. So uh, a kind of old-fashioned uh, his, history education can come in useful. So, uh, so I think you're saying that this uh, uh, kind of global education that you got as a result of who your parents were and of being a, 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 an emerging citizen of a, an empire, you know, in, in the last stages, uh, suggest that that's really how you found your voice as a writer. D d talk a little about that. Well, I, th I, think, um, I think, first of all, if you're not from America, it's easy to write in different markets. If you notice, I, I go around this country, and I'll, if you go, say, to the New York Post, it's full of Australians. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll go to other uh, media outposts in uh, America, and they're full of uh, British people. There's a lot of British, Canadian, Australian people doing very well in the American media. And there's n not really a lot of equivalence to that if you go to, there's not really a lot of Americans working in Britain or Australia and Canada. For one reason, this is the most, uh, this is the number one country yeah. in the world, so if you want to make it, and you're an American, you're already kind of in the, in the top market. Why would you want to go to Canada uh, or, or Australia or Britain? Uh, and, and so I think, I do think one of the advantages, though, of being from those kind of uh, other countries is that it is, it is easier to move around, to write for different markets, for different audiences. And in a sense, which I think is a particular Canadian skill, uh, is Canadians grow up as the world's greatest observer culture. Uh, mm. They're there. The 49th pa parallel, from a Canadian point of view, is the world's biggest store window. And you're, you're on exactly. the outside uh, looking in. Mm. You, uh, I think that's one reason why Canadians are particularly good at, at moving down here and becoming funny guys, whether it's uh, you know, Jim Carrey or Leslie Nielsen or at the more elevated uh, mm. humorist end, as it were, because uh, 
because they watch American pop culture as outsiders, and that can be very useful because you're, uh, you're both an expert in it, but you're also at one remove from it, which gives you a perspective on it, which, uh, as, as I said, I think is particularly useful for comedy. And I think that's, uh, but I think everyone in the, in the, in, in certain parts of the English-speaking world, at least, I think uh, everyone thinks they, thinks they know America. And in fact, I think it's more complicated. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. The longer I live here, the, the more I'm aware that uh, there's, there's, there's things that are profoundly different from uh, countries that uh, a few years ago I thought were much more similar. Mm -hmm. If students and the general public watch this, I always like to uh, ask writers like yourself what you think are the skills and the temperament required for being a, a professional writer? Well, I think, I think the first thing is you just, you just have to do it. I think if you sit around waiting for the great opening sentence, you'll never write anything. <laughs> uh, you mentioned my father. My father uh, was, a, uh, was an art expert, and um, he, uh, he always, for years, he was planning to write a book on, on art. And he used to leave notes for himself by the telephone, and it would be, you know, the note would be, uh, uh, go to post office, uh, pay gardener, write book. And, it's like, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, if you just leave notes <laughs> by the telephone for you like that, you never will never write, write, the write the book. And um, I th so I think a lot of it is just doing it. And I'm often, I, when I uh, started in, uh, in journalism, and you're like a kind of cocky young punk, and you can't quite understand why it is that some of these guys you think are just like middle-aged bores who haven't I written anything interesting in 25 years are holding down all the jobs. And my limited experience of being uh, in the editing rooms at uh, newspapers is that often it's because they're the guys who are reliable, that if you say, we need this by 5 p.m., they deliver it by 5 p.m. You know, we, disparate, we have that awful phrase, oh, he's, he's, he's just phoning it in. Uh, you'd be surprised if you were at the editor, from the editor's point of view, how grateful you are for the guy who phones it in compared to uh, when it's five o'clock and you haven't got the copy and you're waiting there and all that. So I think, I think at a certain level, you've just got to be, you just got to be reliable. You just got to get, get on and do it. And I think after, after that, if you really don't want to be spending a couple of hours a day writing, you really should not be writing. You shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a painfully slow writer compared to a lot of people. I'm always horrified when I uh, hear uh, people saying how long they take to, uh, to write a book or, uh, you know, because I, I, it comes very slowly to me. But I think even if it comes slowly, you've just got to actually sit down there and, uh, and do it. You, you are doing writing in a globalized world with multimedia platforms. How does that complicate your vocation? Well, I don't think, I don't believe you can write for the world. And I think when you try to, um, you produce something very boring. Uh, one example of that, it was something I was just looking at, in fact, for, in preparation for the, for the Nimitz lectures, is uh, General Musharraf's uh, biography, mm -hmm. autobiography, his memoir, In the Line mm -hmm. of Fire. Yeah. Now, when you listen to General Musharraf talk, he has a very engaging and particular way of talking. He speaks uh, that, that kind of uh, clipped yes. uh, uh, Raj English right. that a lot of the Pakistani military do. And it has a particular rhythm and, and beauty of its own. And I love it when he's, uh, he's talking there about these, uh, when you listen to him talk about these Kader chaps in the, uh, in the <laughs> Pakistani tribal lands. Now his book, uh, he did some, I think it was Simon and Schuster in New York, his book has been either ghostwritten or rewritten by his editor into a kind of bland, mm. uh, colorless, standard American English. And as a result, it's not written in, it's a great book in many ways, but it's not written in General Musharraf's voice. And I think that's the danger, that when you just try to write for everybody, you come up with this uh, bland uh, vanilla style. I mean, I occasionally, what I do, if I have a column that's in Australia and it's republished in uh, America, I'll alter, uh, I'll alter some of the slang expressions, uh, mm. but some I won't alter because mm -hmm. I think, well, 
this is actually a great expression. It'd be fun to introduce it to mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. and I think I think uh, that's I think that sometimes uh, I take great. I think the differences in different forms of English are one of the great uh, pleasures of the language. Yeah. So you, but you have to have an ear for that, which you must have. Yes, I do, and I um, and I, and and I think it's difficult. I I think someone said to me once. Well, you know, I had read had had as some kind of exercise had compared a column of mine as it appeared in the Chicago Sun-Times, mm -hmm. the National Post in Canada, and the Daily Telegraph in mm -hmm. Britain, and noticed these uh, particular uh, variations, said, wouldn't it be just great if you could get a software program that would just <laughs> automatically <laughs> replace yeah. the obscure Canadian mm -hmm. reference with an obscure American mm -hmm. reference? Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. these <laughs> translate the page in yeah, Google. Yeah. <laughs> you know what happens. <laughs> yes, yeah. I know. Uh, but I think at some point you have to have a kind of built-in, uh, mm -hmm. you can't... You have to have an error. You, you can't, you've got to have an, and it's not just, it's, all, it's not just about words. I think it's all, it is also about the rhythm of language. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that is, I think it's very, it would be very difficult to fake that. It, it couldn't, you can, it's not quite, it's in a strange way, it's, it, because it's subtler, it's, it's not as easy as, um, uh, you know, uh, learning to speak an entirely foreign language. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, uh, that's why um, uh, you can't, you, if you, unless you have a kind of aptitude for that, you yeah. just can't plow through it. Uh, translate. I there's a very. I mentioned Kingsley Amis earlier. I don't want to kind of beat up on his son Martin Amis, no. but his his son has always loved America, and he wrote a couple of years ago. He wrote a, a kind of uh, a, an attempt at a kind of authentic American kind of postmodern thriller type thing, and I thought the his, his ear for Americanism was just completely ridiculous mm. and absurd, right. and unconvincing. Uh, I think I think at some point you've got to have uh, you, you've got to have your own voice, but you've got to occasionally be you've got to know you've also got to know your audience, and know when you're better off saying bloke rather than guy or whatever. That's quite important. Andrew uh, uh, Roberts, English-speaking people since 1900. Right. Do you think he's managed to to catch the sort of international resonance that will? Uh, allow that to work equally in any one of the of the anglosphere markets or the anglophone markets well andrew is a great uh is a great uh a popular historian mm -hmm. and a great writer but he he writes much more i would say in a in a British voice. Mm -hmm. I, I, I regard myself much more as the kind of uh, the classic rootless cosmopolitan, you oh, know, when, <laughs> when uh, in, in, in both in my sinister membership right. of the International Zionist Conspiracy and all the <laughs> other things I get accused of, uh, but, also, but also I think in, in, in my writing style, there's, there's, lots of, uh, there's, there's lots of bits, I think. There's, 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 there's bits about Amer American English, oddly enough, was the first language I fell in love with, really just from uh, things like Warner Brothers movies mm -hmm. and, from, and from popular songs, you'd hear, you'd hear odd phrases. Yes. Uh, and, 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 it was, and they were really the first things to start me talking about English, uh, thinking about English uh, as a language, because obviously when you're a child, English is a given and you're learning Latin and French and all the rest of it. And uh, so that was the so uh, Warner Brothers kind of gangster talk was mm. one of the first things mm. that got me interested in English. But I so I love th that side. But I also love, uh, you know, Evelyn Waugh and, and P. G. Woodhouse, and 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 you can hear that kind of clash sometimes in columns where mm. there'll be some. Uh, there'll be a, a lurch from the Amer robust American vernacular into something slightly more uh, effete and ornate. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, the, uh, but, you know, I, I like that. But before we talk about your book, I have one more question, and that is your, when, when you look at the body of your work, you, there, there's, there are interesting things going on uh, in your vocation, I think. And one is that you are redefining what a public intellectual is, or you're part of that process. Mm -hmm. But secondly, you're writing about, you know, movies, theater, musical, politics, war, and so on. Uh, any comments about how you bring all that together and, and how it makes a difference in the way you do your work? Well, well I went, um, a couple of months ago, I was in Australia, and I went into the ABC, which is their big national broadcaster, 
uh, thinking I was going to do a show on the uh, on the jihad and uh, and global politics and everything. And I got there, and the guy says uh, says, "Well, here's the way we're going to do it. First, I want to talk about uh, songwriting for the first half hour, and then we'll move into the end of the world." <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Last things first. And, uh, <laughs> And I go, oh, great, oh, sure, sure, so, you know, we'll do, they don't write them like they used to for half an hour, and then it's the end, it's the apocalypse, mm -hmm. let's head for the hills. Uh, and, and, of course, we had, a had to make a transition. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, at 28 minutes past the half hour or whatever, we had to stop talking about beloved old songs and slide into, I think it was... Uh, you know, whatever particular war and conflagration was happening that morning. I hope you used Waltzing Matilda to make that. Well, I would have, <laughs> I would have, I would have uh, appreciated some, some music. Play. But I made the point that in an idea, obviously if in an ideal world, I love writing about music, I love writing about film and theatre, and I would do that if this was an ideal world. But I don't think, I think at some point, if there are great things going on in the world and you want to say something about them and you don't, it's not going to be any consolation to me to have a great CD collection uh, as Western civilization mm -hmm. falls apart. Uh, in a sense, you've got to, if you, if you value the, uh, the freedom to uh, stroll into uh, some uh, uh, piano bar in a hotel somewhere on the planet, and hear a great singer singing uh, The Way You Look Tonight or whatever, you've got to understand that even that little miniature experience is at the apex of a whole cultural foundation uh, and that you can't just sort of share off the small pleasures of a 32-bar song from all the big, uh, big geopolitical issues. They are explicitly connected in that sense. Mm -hmm. Let me show your book now, and then let's talk about your book, America Alone, The End of the World, as we know it, and draw you out on that uh, subject. Uh, I think uh, one of the first points that comes across very strongly is your uh, view of Europe and its failure to meet uh, the, the challenges of our world. Talk a little about that. What's wrong with Europe? Well, I think Europe is in a profoundly weak state. Uh, as such, it, it faces a, a perfect storm of crises that it is never, that it would require huge skill to be able to line up uh, like some kind of Rubik's Cube and figure out a way to, to get it all properly aligned. And I don't think the political class in Europe, which is an astonishingly complacent political class and one that is not as responsive to uh, popular pressures as exists in the United States, I think it's much more closed in that respect. I think it's going to be very unlikely uh, that they will muster the uh, will to see that through. But, you know, their first problem is a basic one, which they is that they have uh, deathbed demography, uh, which is to say that uh, 17 European countries mm -hmm. are basically at what they call uh, lowest low fertility, fertility rates, rates, which is 1.3 or below, uh, which no society has recovered from. Now, that you can look at falling fertility rates around the world. Uh, also, it's also happening in Japan. It's also happening in Canada. It's also happening in, um, in, in parts of, uh, of uh, Asia. Uh, but uh, who gets there first? Uh, it, it, to, mm -hmm. to the real deathbed numbers is going to be critical. And right now, the Europeans are online to get there first. What have they done? Uh, in effect, they imported a Muslim population to be the children they couldn't be bothered having. Uh, and that, in turn, I think, has, uh, is transforming the political character of the continent at a very swift rate. And so I wrote the book, in a sense, because I... I think that uh, this idea that somehow it's simply George W. Bush's Texan boorishness uh, that affronts Europe is, is not really the issue here. He could speak beautiful French uh, and be charming uh, and sophisticated with Jacques Chirac at continental banquets at uh, the Elysee Palace, and it would make absolutely no difference because what we're seeing here is a profound divergence uh, between the continent of Europe and the United States that will become a permanent feature of life. If you were Jacques Chirac, you, you have, it's, and you had 40% Muslim youth unemployment rates in your cities, mm -hmm. the last thing you need 
is to send your troops marching into battle alongside the great Satan. That simply is not going to be a priority for you in any uh, rational scenario. And that's nothing to do with how swaggering Bush is or how much of a, uh, a Texan gunslinger he is or any of the things that European cartoonists make, uh, make fun of him for. Now, what, what do you see as the root causes uh, that come out of domestic policy that essentially, uh, what, the welfare state and that route has, has led to an internal bankruptcy that is uh, contributing to things like the, the, the deathbed demography? Well, I do think you can, in a sense, uh, uh, simply, when life, life becomes too soft and amusing, I think it's very hard to reconnect with something as basic as a survival instinct. You know, in a sense, uh, what, what, is, what is mysterious uh, to often to people who look at it from this side of uh, the Atlantic is uh, the French, for example, have much, much more free time than we do. They, they work much shorter weeks. They have a 35-hour week. They retire earlier. They have paid vacation, long, 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 long paid vacations. Uh, and uh, similarly in Germany. Germany has very generous uh, employment provision, uh, education provision. You know, people stay at school until well into their early mid-30s and, uh, and, and they retire very early. And you think to yourself, well, what do they do with all this free time? Uh, you cannot look, an, uh, look on, what they, uh, on, on the way Europeans live and think today that they are producing great art uh, great music or any of these other things. Uh, uh, there are other features, I think, that of European life that indicate that, in a sense, they be quite kind of softened into a kind of semi-comatose state. Not just that shows not just in the demography, but in the lack, the whole lack of energy, artistic energy, entrepreneurial energy on the continent. Mm. You talk about civilization exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you make a distinction between primary versus secondary impulses. Uh, let's follow up on that because it, it's the way you develop this idea of where Europe has gone wrong. Yes, I mean, I think you, I think you can reach a point where the state over guarantees so much of life uh, that simply that you can maintain a population in a kind of permanent adolescence. And, and in a sense, we're, we're halfway there, and Canada is, uh, you know, 80% of the way there. It's not just a European um, phenomenon. We, we think it entirely normal, uh, not just the Europeans, but many people in this country, think it entirely normal, for example, that the state should be responsible for our health care. Uh, while we, uh, we expect to be able, if we go to the supermarket, we expect to be able to choose from a range of 100 breakfast cereals. If we're ordering a cable TV package, we expect to get 500 channels. We demand more and more choice uh, in peripheral areas of life, but, we, uh, but on the critical issues, we're happy to mortgage the choices to uh, the government. And I think at a certain point, you reach the point where you can actually sever people from basic uh, basic uh, survival instincts and certainly from the cross-generational impulse. If you, think, if you think it's perfectly normal that your rather boring elderly parents should become the charges of the state because you don't want to have them living in your spare bedroom uh, so the state should pay for them to go off and live somewhere else. It's very easy then to say, figure out if you can do without grandparents that you can also do without grandchildren. Mm -hmm. It's not such a big leap and it certainly happened in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, one might argue that uh, uh, changes in society, changes in the international economy are all almost making these things that you're describing as inevitable, an inevitable consequence. How, how do you respond to that? In other words, help us understand why this isn't inevitable and what you have to do about it to, to make it not be inevitable. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, and I should say up front, I should have said earlier, you know, I, I certainly uh, don't pretend to have the answer to uh, all the questions, um, you know, even on shows like this. Uh, but, but I think um, you, it's hard to deny that there aren't very big questions out there. Now, I, I look at the United States, for example. Uh, we can figure out which kinds of societies don't work. You can make arguments in Europe about which uh, countries have high birth rates and low birth rates, but the, however you slice it, they're all failing to maintain stable populations. Mm -hmm. By contrast, 
If you uh, look at, uh, for example, um, uh, the United States, in amongst all its particular problems that people like to point out, the 40 million with no health insurance, the massive gun crime and all the rest of it, it nevertheless, in its core statistics, is the one healthy Western nation. Mm -hmm. So you can say to yourself, if I were European, I'd say to myself, well, we can, we can argue about which of our, whether Sweden's system is marginally less bad than Italy's, but in the end, they're all, they're all failing on the core numbers, on the key numbers. America isn't. Maybe we should learn from America. Mm -hmm. you, you say at one point, social programs are a security threat because they weaken the ultimate line of defense, the freeborn citizen whose responsibilities are not subcontracted to the government. Yes, I think that, I think that is uh, true. I think it's very different uh, in Europe. The, the response of the Spaniards, for example, to the March 11th bombings three years ago, you can argue about particular aspects of that, but the fact is that the, this is a people that fought a bloody civil war in the 1930s. Uh, faced with an external challenge this time round, they just basically shrugged and said, okay, it's not that important to us, let's, uh, let's give up. I think you can see the same thing happening uh, in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, a kind of ennui that, uh, that sets in. It's interesting to me that uh, three years ago when I first started writing about demographic issues and positing a kind of Islamification of the continent, People said to me, uh, ah, this is the people, European commentators said, uh, this, is, this is nonsense, this is rubbish, it's not going to happen. Now a lot of them said, say, well, yes, it is going to happen, but maybe it won't be so bad. And, uh, and, and another group of them say, okay, well, maybe it will be bad, but there's nothing we can do about it. So we might, you just have to accept it. I, that fatalism, I think, is not a healthy, so all, all, successful, all successful societies have a kind of vigor. And in part, uh, one of the problems that we deal with in the Middle East, for example, is that there again is a kind of fatalism that is built into certain aspects of uh, Arab culture. Uh, no successful society is simply fatalistic, and a lot of continental Europe is. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece of your book, uh, which I will show again, America Alone, uh, is the threat posed by Islam. Uh, let's talk a little about that because it, it, it follows naturally because this Europe that you've just described is, is incapable of addressing the problem and in fact has become codependent uh, uh, or rather dependent on the Islamic uh, world to, as you said, to bring in so that Europe can bring in people to have the workers to fund the, the right. social security uh, system for the aging uh, Europeans. Yeah. So what what is particularly uh, the main aspect of the, of the threat of, your, of the Islam? Well, well um, th there's really two parts uh, to that. Um, th there's obviously, and one should say uh, straight out, there's obviously millions and millions of Muslims around the world who just want to live their lives, get on with their lives. Uh, but what we're seeing is not just an increase in Muslim population around the world, a very dramatic increase. It holds a much bigger share of the mm -hmm. population. Uh, now than it did in the 1970s. Uh, but we're seeing also a radicalization of those Muslim populations and a conscious radicalization of those populations uh, from Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other uh, forces. Now, it hasn't radicalized 100% of them. Uh, it hasn't radicalized 50% of them. But what percentage of them does it have to radicalize for it to place a, a profound question mark over the future of uh, societies with significant Muslim populations. You know, we often talk about how there's not a lot of freedom in the Muslim world. It's also the case there's not a lot of freedom uh, once uh, a Muslim population gets to about 20 percent. Uh, if you look at the sort of statistics on this, uh, if, if a Muslim population is somewhere between 20 and 50 percent, um, uh, it's, the, it's harder to operate what we in America would regard as a classically liberal society. I think there were three exceptions to that. Uh, Serbia and Montenegro, uh, Benin and Suriname in uh, the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, former, the former Dutch uh, colony. And um, so those are not, and I don't think those would be regarded as successful models by the United States. So what does it mean, for example, to the Netherlands, 
when they face uh, that situation, really within uh, the next generation? Are they going to be a fourth exception to that rule, a, uh, a, Muslim, a, a state with a 20% Muslim population that is, uh, that is still relatively free, or will they already be reaching accommodations to find ways of not offending those Muslim populations. When you look at this itsy bitsy news items, two schools in Berlin have introduced separate entrance ways now uh, for Muslim students and non-Muslim students. You're already seeing signs that the European response uh, to this will be uh, forms of uh, segregation, uh, in forms of restrictions on, on the speech of everybody in order to accommodate certain minorities. That is not going to be a successful way to, to go. People in the audience might say you're walking a fine line here, that, that what you're saying sounds racist. Uh, but I want to draw your argument out to, to make the point that, that that isn't the case. And what I want to address is something you say. You say global jihad lurks within Islam and Islam is a political project. And the, the example that you were just giving was suggesting that there is in Islamic culture a lack of div division between what we consider to be secular and what uh, is considered to be religious, which goes back to this whole problem of the separation of the state from religion right. uh, that, that Islam uh, uh, never mastered. And, and I, I gather that's the point that you're trying to make, that there is an insinuation in Western society where the, the, what we call multiculturalism opens us up to not dealing well with this contradiction. No, I think Islam differs from uh, Christianity, uh, say, in that it is an explicitly political project and indeed an explicitly um, imperial project too that I think uh, Muslims are enjoined, uh, in effect, to at, uh, eventually bring the entire world within the House of Islam. By conquest, that was the way Muhammad saw it. He was a great warrior. Uh, he didn't do the Jesus thing. With Jesus' final words to his disciples before he ascended into heaven were uh, told them to go to all the cities in the known world and persuade people. So you look at how Christianity developed. It percolated up from the lowest members of society uh, eventually up to the top. If you, if, you, if you look at the way Islam advanced, it advanced mainly by conquest. Uh, I think that, that uh, difference is built into Islam. Uh, and I don't regard it as a uh, racist issue, in part because I think Islam has a lot of, of appeal to pasty white folks. Uh, if you look at recent news stories, you can see that uh, we, we're seeing more and more uh, white converts to Islam who are being att uh, uh, attracted to some of these uh, jihadist elements. They, this plot uh, last summer uh, it, it, to, to seize these various uh, uh, airliners at Heathrow uh, and blow them up uh, en route to America or over America, one of, the, one of the fellows involved in that, his name was, he changed his name to Mohammed bin Jihad or whatever, but he was actually, he, he was actually the son of a conservative party agent called, he had a name like, you know, Nigel Fotheringay Phipps or something, straight <laughs> out of P.G. Woodhouse. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he, he was like Bertie Worcester the jihadist. And so this, I don't think it is a racial issue. I think this is, in a sense, an, uh, a, 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 an, ide a, an ideology that has great appeal, whatever uh, particular uh, race uh, you happen to belong to. Uh, and I think that that is the, I think we have a difficulty uh, understanding that aspect of it because when a mosque opens uh, on Main Street, we don't, in our mind, we don't distinguish between that and a new congregational church opening or a new Episcopal church. And we see it as a house of God uh, and that is all it is, but it is not all it is. And also in our particular, as you mentioned multiculturalism, I think, I think in a multicultural society, um, in a sense, uh, it, uh, we have great difficulty, I think, uh, coping uh, with uh, the idea of a kind of unicultural society. And Islam is really the perfect unicultural mm -hmm. society in which, in which both your faith and your political system are bound up in this one perfect system. Um, and a multicultural society that wants to just put Islam as one of those things on the smorgasbord with, uh, 
uh, with uh, Episcopalianism and Baptism and Catholicism and Judaism and Buddhism and New Age and Wiccans and all the rest. It's not. It's something more than that. Mm -hmm. And Kay, who mm -hmm. tackled you on a Book Notes program a little while ago, uh, what would you give your final answer? What, what's, what's your final answer to Kay? Wherever well, she was. Who is Kay now? <laughs> uh, who well, she was a she was a lady caller on a uh, on a show I was uh, a show I was on, and uh, she had that thing which I find slightly unnerving, which is that that kind of uh, faintly sort of new age passivity that people have. Mm -hmm. I don't mind. I quite like the kind of conspiracists who say. Oh, you know, Bush pulled off 9-11, it was an uh, inside job and all that, because at least they're kind of engaged. Uh, Kay belongs to a, uh, a group that I regard as, as really much, much more worrying, is the people who are sort of exist in a, in a fluffy cloud of mm -hmm. multicultural complacency. Uh, if they cite uh, any historical precedents to you, it's always uh, uh, Martin Luther King uh, and uh, Gandhi. And I think it's very easy uh, to adopt that strategy if you're dealing uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, racist uh, American rednecks or uh, British uh, imperial administrators. I don't believe either of their strategies would have worked if you were up against the guys who killed all those kids in uh, that schoolhouse in Chechnya uh, or the fellows who blew up the nightclub in Bali. Uh, and I think that I think this idea that some that the sort of give peace a chance thing is not going to work here. I mean, these, these are people who are, you know, I quoted to Kay, a, thinking it would get a rise out of her, uh, poor lady, uh, the, the words of a British Muslim speaking at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, somebody in the audience said, what is Mohammed's message to unbelievers? And he said, Mohammed's message to unbelievers is, I am here to slaughter you all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I quoted, <laughs> Direct. And I, Direct. I, I quoted this <laughs> line to Kay, and she goes, well, that only means uh, we have to redouble our efforts to work even harder. Now, what she means by redouble our efforts to work even harder is she basically means she's not making any effort. She's not going to redouble anything. She just doesn't want to think about it. She mm. doesn't want to have to think about it. And I think the idea that it makes no difference to a society, if you happen to uh, live in a town and uh, it's 80% uh, congregationalist, I'm no fan. I'm not citing them as an, I'm no fan of the Congregation <laughs> Church at all, really. Uh, but but let's let's say, say that for a start. Eighty percent Congregationalist and twenty percent Muslim, or it's eighty percent Muslim and twenty percent Congregationalist. Those are two very different societies. Mm -hmm. You make a point of uh, emphasizing the Saudi role in uh, bringing out some of the worst aspects of Islam and, and pushing this Wahhabi strain, which we, we were talking about earlier. Uh, let, let's play that out a little. In other words, how do you see them, uh, w what is their nefarious role in all of this in making the possibilities of Islam go in a direction that, that really leads to terrorism? Well, I, I think Saudi Arabia is the great uh, foreign policy mistake of the 20th century. It, it's a state that should never have been created and never entrusted uh, to that family. And uh, Ibn Saud, God bless him, uh, very successfully played off the British and the Americans Absolutely. against each other in that. I think the whole of the modern Middle East, which was invented you know, by the British and French in 1922, is a disaster, uh, in fact. But even um, on the scale of that disaster, the creation of Saudi Arabia is far worse. Uh, it, it speaks, I think, to uh, one of the more problematic aspects of the United States, which is that uh, America is a non-imperial superpower. Uh, so it, it, in a sense, it's always preferred to do business through clients. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in this case, it created these clients in the Middle East, and they turned into a monster. Now, when the president says, uh, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. The short answer to that is that Saudi Arabia has, uh, has checked the both of the above box. Uh, mm -hmm. Occasionally, they're, they're more, the, the, the princes they put up on CNN uh, give the impression that they're with us. But the, they're also funding, they're the main ideological funders of uh, our enemies around the world. Mm 
Uh, and it's not just that they're both with us and with the terrorists, but that every time uh, somebody goes and gases up uh, at, uh, and fills their car up, they, they too are funding both sides of this war. Because Saudi Arabia's principal export is not oil, but ideology. And all mm -hmm. the oil does uh, is enable them to fund the ideology. Mm -hmm. Is the prescription then to declientize them, to pull the rug out from underneath the Saudi royal family? What do we do? I think, I think uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of these people who thinks that uh, if you get rid of the House of Saud, whatever follows will be worse. Mm -hmm. I think that there would be a lot of benefits to uh, basically, uh, you know, in a sense, the jihad at one level is a Saudi problem that the Saudis successfully yes. exported to the rest of the world. It would be a very good thing to repatriate the problem and uh, say that if they want to uh, duke this thing out, they would be better to do it in the Arabian so. Peninsula. Uh, rather, rather than in uh, Indonesia and uh, Central Asia and Europe and North America and all the other parts of the planet they've destabilized. Obama, go home. Uh, right. <laughs> you, you say, so you make an intriguing uh, point, an important point uh, in discussing Islam. You say the moderation of Islam comes from the surrounding culture, meaning the places uh, where Islam has gone and been shaped and adapted uh, by uh, culture. Talk a little about that because that's an important point and you see Europe unable to do that yes. but clearly we in the United States are able to to some extent do do yes, it successfully. I, I think I think I'm not you know I'm not uh, complacent about about it at all but I do think that the United States is a much better job of assimilating Muslims uh, than the Europeans do. Uh, there is an American dream and uh, Muslims can tap into that. If there is a Belgian dream or a French dream, mm -hmm. Muslims are by and large excluded from it. I mean, it's a, a horrible, these dehumanizing estates that they keep uh, Muslims in in France. Uh, uh, it's, it's a shocking and disgraceful, and a disgraceful thing. Uh, and that's why, in effect, they're becoming more radicalized with each generation. So when you look back and you think, well, what are the kind of societies in which Islam exists in a kind of more or less benign tension with the broader society? Uh, they're not very encouraging examples. Central Asia under the Soviets, those Muslims uh, in, uh, in, in, in that part of the world, in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, they, they were moderate imbibers of alcohol, not on the same industrial level as the average Slav was <laughs> to the north, but uh, uh, they certainly uh, were moderate, as I said, moderate drinkers, and, uh, and Islam was not a problem under the Soviets. Within months, in effect, of the collapse of the Soviet Union, these, the Saudis and the Iranians had spent all this walking around money up there and successfully radicalized them. One exception, Turkmenistan, where the crazy dictator, mm -hmm. uh, Turkmenbashi, uh, effectively wrote his own Koran, this absurd book, which is like uh, some Deepak Chopra rewrite of the Koran, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, demanded it be placed in every mosque. And when the uh, head imam objected to it, he basically fired him and tossed him in jail. Uh, and, uh, and this guy, again, it's the, one, uh, it's the one stan where there aren't guys jumping up and down in the street shouting death to the great Satan. Um, similarly, Indonesia under the dictatorship. Now, of course, if you say this to Americans, these are not encouraging examples. So, you know, if that's what it takes to moderate Islam, nobody here wants to become the Soviet Union or uh, Turkmenbashi or the Indonesian dictatorship. Even when you look at um, British India, which held Islam in, uh, in its Muslim minority there in a kind of uh, controlled state, even that is not an encouraging example uh, to, to the Americans. But it does show, I think, that Islam, in a sense, uh, is as opportunist as the broader society allows. And the problem in uh, Europe is that the modern multicultural state of continental Europe is a nullity. Even if you wanted to assimilate with it, how could you? What does it mean to be uh, British in the year 2007? The fellows who blew up the London Tube were British born and bred. They'd been raised in British schools, uh, they uh, they'd liked fish and chips, they liked cricket, they liked lousy English pop music and leisure wear, and in the end they got on those tubes and blew up their fellow British subjects. Uh, simply put, there is in, in those, ki those societies that promote this kind of weak, weedy, lowest common denominator multiculturalism, there's nothing to assimilate to. So why do you believe that America is uniquely qualified alone to, to address uh, 
these problems? Well, I think America, in some ways, and one, you know, obviously, in a sense, this is a 50-50 nation, and uh, at any one time, mm. half the country will disagree on some of these things. But America is uh, the last, really the last state in the Western world, with the possible exception of Australia, where qualities like uh, self-reliance uh, are still valued, where the uh, birth rate is still healthy, uh, and where it is still not the accepted role of life uh, that the, the primal responsibilities of adulthood should be exercised by the government. Uh, you know, that is true. When, when I bought my house in New Hampshire, I was a bit, I was a kind of urban guy, I wasn't too used to living in the country, and that first night I heard something which was, you know, probably just a, uh, uh, some uh, kind of animal wandering around the door, and I, I got a little nervous, and uh, uh, I called my police chief and said, well, uh, what should I do with it? Uh, if it's an intruder, what should I do? And the police chief went, uh, well, you know, you need to disable him yourself <laughs> because if you call me, I'll be asleep. <laughs> and, uh, and by the time I get there, <laughs> Uh, and by the time I get there, I'll be dragging you out. I'd much rather drag him out. And this is, uh, that is simply not something you would ever hear, no. uh, for example, in the United Kingdom. No. In the United Kingdom, if you hear somebody, my poor old sister-in-law lives in bucolic part of uh, the English countryside. She hears somebody prowling around the perimeter. She calls 999, which is their 911, and it comes through... Uh, to, uh, to, some, uh, to some answering machine off uh, the coast of Scotland somewhere, and right. they get back to her two weeks later. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's simply, simply put, this is, I think, the last, uh, the, even in, in, a, in a vulnerable state, this is the last country where people, uh, where, uh, where what we would regard as uh, traditional impulses of adulthood are still wielded by a significant proportion of the population. It, it seems to me that in your book, what, what your, your you see resolve in confronting these threats is very important. But on the other hand, you are also open to a array of uh, vehicles for dealing with the threat. Is that fair? Yes, I do think resolve is what matters um, because I think uh, nobody, nobody is scared of America's nuclear arsenal. They're scared about the possibility of America using it. You can have all the tanks and all the uh, uh, ships and all the guns in the world, and if nobody thinks they ever have to fear you using them, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference at all. And in fact, that is the calculation uh, that America's enemies have made through, uh, on the basis of things like uh, Mogadishu uh, 10 years ago, they, basi they basically concluded uh, that that the vast arsenal counts for as nothing measured against uh, a, few do uh, a few dozen body bags on TV. Uh, that in a sense America is uh, like a late period Ottoman sultan uh, lying on his cushions and if you prick him in, your to in his toes he'll howl up in pain. He's not a genuine superpower. That's the calculation uh, that the jihad has made. Uh, and that Ahmadinejad makes, and that Kim Jong Il makes, and that a lot of others make, and America, at some level, has to show that that is a false mm -hmm. view of the United States. Mm -hmm. But but you also suggest in your book that uh, emphasizing women's rights in the Islamic world that there there are various vulnerabilities yes. Yes. that one has to play yes. uh, to 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 succeed. I, I'm in favor of creative destabilization. I think it's disgraceful yes. that this uh, country spends a fortune. Yep on intelligence uh, uh, operations and gets nothing from the CIA. The CIA sits around in Langley, Virginia and reads emails from outer space all day. That's, that's mm -hmm. what they do. And it's outrageous. Uh, and, and there are a lot of things that we could be doing that would, would ensure that those guys had a few of the headaches uh, that, uh, that we do and that a lot of European prime ministers have right at this moment. And the, and the women's rights issue, I think, is absolutely the critical mm -hmm. wedge into that world. Because it's true, a lot of women, I mean, you look at uh, the appeal of Islam on the continent, where a lot of, it's a lot of women who convert to Islam. They don't, it's clear that there is a substantive chunk of uh, modern Western women who don't want to, don't regard Britney Spears as the be-all and end-all, don't want to go around with navel piercings, find the sort of slatternliness of, of, uh, of, of that all very, but that doesn't mean, on the other hand, 
that they want to live in a world that starts with genital mutilation and ends with honor killing. There is a vast potential for subversion uh, by bringing women's rights uh, to the forefront of American policy, which doesn't mean sending Karen Hughes to traipse around uh, the Arab world <laughs> in a designer burqa. Uh, you know, that is completely ridiculous. But there, uh, there, we, it should not be beyond the wit of this country for the amount of money it spends on intelligence uh, to, to figure out uh, how to use that as a wedge into the Muslim world. Are Mark, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm afraid our time no, is I'm out, okay. uh, Tom. We're, we've <laughs> just about, I want, Mark, I want to thank you very much for coming to be the Nimitz Lecturer and appearing on our program. And I will show your book one more time, America Alone. And thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank, here, thank here. you. I, I, I've been a little ill at ease with the Berkeley <laughs> dress code. This is the first, your show is the first thing I've done here. I haven't worn a tie for, oh, and now you're wearing one. That's well, we're, we've got to fool the audience. Yeah, yeah right, that's exactly. right. And yes, Tom, thank you very thank much you for very joining much, us. Harry. And Glad thank you, thank you Mark. Uh, very much for joining us for this conversation with history.